Yo. Yo. 50 years of hip hop. 50 years of hip hop from Listener Power, KEXP. Welcome to 50 Years of Hip Hop. I'm Larry Mizell Jr. Throughout this series, we've explored the culture of hip hop in many ways, but mostly through the music. Hip hop culture is also known for producing some of the most revolutionary visual art of the 20th century. And this week, Janice Headley takes us back to 1976 with an exclusive interview with the legendary Lee Quinones, graffiti artist, actor. He and his crew, The Fabulous Five, made history by tagging a 10-car train in a single night. You also probably know Lee Quinones for starring in the classic hip-hop film, Wild Style. Lee was born in Puerto Rico and raised in the Lower East Side. As a preteen, he began hitting the streets, tagging subway cars, which quickly grew into painting large, intricate murals over the entire car, a 50-foot by 8-foot metal canvas. His work was colorful and thoughtful, often with an underlying message of social justice. He'd write poetic messages like, If we don't use our heads now, we may lose our tails later. And, If art like this is a crime, let God forgive me. He eventually joined the Fabulous Five Graffiti Crew, where fellow artist and hip-hop pioneer Fab Five Freddy got his nickname. And then, in the winter of 1976, he did his biggest hit to date. In one single night, he and the Fabulous Five tagged an entire 10-car subway line. The act crowned Lee a hip-hop folk hero and was a defining moment in the artist's career. In an exclusive interview with KEXP, Lee talks with us about that night and how he feels to be celebrating 50 years of hip-hop. Lee Quinones, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So Lee, you have had an amazing art career over the past 50 years, starting in 1974 when a 14-year-old you first started doing graffiti. What inspired you to pick up that spray paint can? I think a number of things uh, factored in. It was uh, basically my curiosity. Uh, so many uh, world events, global events were at play at the time. The Vietnam War is still on, unofficially. Lots of social and uh, racial problems were plaguing the city. The city was pretty much on a huge deficit. It basically was an open door as a creative, as a visual person myself, was to, you know, latch on to something that was much more, it was more organic and natural to me. You know, picking up a pencil and a paper is the easiest thing. And picking up alongside this movement that was started by young people uh, was was a natural. So I think that I just wanted to, um, you know, investigate that. I love that. And so you know, we're here today to talk about an iconic moment early in your career in 1976. You were only 16 years old and you and the Fabulous Five crew tagged a 10 car subway train in one night. First off, can you tell us about the Fabulous Five? They were quite a eclectic group of guys. They were very interesting. They came from all walks of life, all different ethnicities and uh, economic backgrounds, um, challenged as I was. And they were like a brotherhood. They were basically a quintet of guys that were really interested in creating personas and creating an existence. And I think that's the real, the real backbone of the movement was to create a, a sense of self and self-agency in a very anonymous way, strangely enough, because we were sort of um, an enigma force at that time. So these guys um, latched on to what I was already doing in 1975, uh, which by that year, when you think about it, starting in 74, by 75, I'm already creating big entire whole car, subway car murals within a year's time. And they somehow found a, a new outlet. So they banded together alongside with me and created a really good, strong brotherhood of um, creativeness. So it was very unique at the time. How did you guys initially meet? The funny story is that they just met me on a train station by coincidence, looking out for one of my cars. 
So I had done a car the night before, and they already were aware that my work was running on the rails. They were just intrigued. Like, who is this guy? What is this force? Is this a, is this a group of people working that fast and that vast? And it was just myself. I was very, very self de- determined at, at that early age to create a new dialogue and a new conversation around the movement itself, because I just felt like even by 1975, I thought that the graffiti movement had probably achieved everything that it could achieve. So that's how I just said, I want to bring it up a notch. I want to bring up the volume, push the envelope, uh, all of those things. And I think that that's what made them very curious to seek me out. A classic New York serendipitous moment. We met on the subway station, my home station at Brooklyn Bridge. They were like, how could you be Lee? I'm like, I am. And uh, I didn't know who they were, but I felt the vibe in the room at that point. I felt that this was a group of guys that I could find sanctuary in, and they found uh, inspiration in my work. So whose idea was it to do 10 cars in one night? A crazy notion came to me that I should create. It's not only just to create a huge accordion mural, if you want to call it. This is when when 10 cars are connected, they're coupled, and they sort of like an an accordion worm, worming itself through the city. I looked at it more of as, as a statement that this movement was now reaching for the sky, that it was moving on to a new plateau. And that there was a new conversation that need to, needed to be had in the room. So that was my first intuition to create something that had never been done before to the point where it would come out to the public the way it did. They, the Fabulous Five, thought that I was out of my mind. And I still think I am. But, uh, you know, craziness makes things happen, right? So it's when you're being too uh, reserved and maybe conserved <laughs> that uh, you just stay stagnant and idle. But when you think about things in the, in the sense like, well, no one's ever done it, so why why hasn't anyone tried to to challenge that? You know, as history uh, now knows, it was a, a, a huge success. Um, so they thought I was crazy, and um, I thought I was crazy not to do it. Now, was there an overall concept for the 10 cars? Well, because I had been thinking about this project, if you want to call it, or maybe even a caper. Conceptually, I was thinking about it as a sort of a stream of colors, because I always looked at subways as these moving objects that they're either idle in front of you to gobble you up and swallow you up or spit you out at the stations. But when it's in motion on express tracks, it's creating this whole new dynamic and this whole new energy source. So I wanted to create something that would be very flashy, but it would be very stimulating color-wise. So I designed the majority of the cars to be legible, first and foremost, so that you could see it from afar, especially when they were in the elevated structures in the upper reaches of the Bronx or in the uh, down in Brooklyn. I knew that this train, if it was successful, it would travel a certain length, uh, going through a gauntlet of all kinds of emotions from people. I wanted it to be very identifiable because at the, by that time, there was so much work happening on the subways. I wanted it to stand out as that one statement that this is now growing legs. It's upping the temperature in the room. And uh, it, it was quite a feat. It was quite a feat. What line, I guess, subway line, yeah, what was it? And why did you target that particular one? Well, first and foremost, the IRT Lexington Avenue, number five, was my home line. Uh, Number five is my favorite number. The Fabulous Five came from the five boroughs. There's a number of reasons why, by by happenstance, that five has always been part of my, my numerical miracle, right, to say... But I picked that line strategically because I knew that it went through different neighborhoods in the city that would, some neighbors would embrace it. Some neighborhoods would probably be a little confused, maybe even defused at some moments. I I think a lot of New Yorkers were, you know, they've seen it all, but this was something that they've never seen ever. And I wanted to bring that surprise onto the table. So 
the five was picked because it was basically the rolling Whitney museum on wheels to me. And that was because it went through the privileged and more gilded neighborhoods of Park Avenue and Madison Avenue. And then it went into the South Bronx, which was a challenge neighborhood, you know, marginalized people, dystopian atmosphere, uh, hopelessness. And then into the Northeast Bronx, where there was, again, a suburban existence, white picket fences, and well-groomed lawns. And I just felt that a train that can travel from those different temperatures in the room was the best choice for such a statement. So can you take us back to that night? Well, I remember it like it was yesterday. I already have 40 pages written about it, but I won't give away the ending like they say. (laughs) Gangbusters! It was uh, quite a feat in not only the physical parts of it, the strain, you know, just like the constant painting with no rest in between because you're working within a window of time. You can put it as a mixture of Navy SEALs meets the traditional Japanese ninja kind of operation where it had to be very, very seriously sort of synchronized. And I thought it out in my head a year before because initially I was going to do it on my own, not thinking that anyone would come on board. But then I meet the Fabulous Five. They came on board and they saw the seriousness in my eye. That's when I knew that there was a brotherhood there. And that's when they knew that this kid here is out of his mind, but we're going to follow suit. We're going to follow. We're going to follow him. He has a certain trajectory that we just need to be part of. We we can't question it. There's a few moments in my career that I've said to myself, wow, I've arrived as an artist. And that was one of my first arrivals. Maybe it was more bravado, you know, having cojones, as they say. And once we got through that, the effects of it the next day were, it's unimaginable how in 1976, when the whole city is burning down, I'm sorry, the Bronx was burning, but so was the Lower East Side. So was Bushwick. So was Jamaica, Queens. So was Stapleton, Staten Island. So was many parts of the city that were very much challenged. And the fire down below was the heart and soul of a young group of people that said, we want to paint the town red. We don't want to spill red from our bodies, our our minds, our potential. And I just felt like this was a way of sort of creating a dialogue within everyone as a group and maybe even as individuals that this is not the end game here. This is just the start of a much bigger potential. Do you remember the first time you saw it go by and what your feelings were? I was chasing it pretty much the majority of the day because when I came back onto the station that morning, already other graffitiists had said, that, you know, with wide eyes open and jaws dropped, they were like, it just went uptown. It. It was it. They, 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 they couldn't even fathom a word for it, like your masterpiece or anything. They just said, it just left the station. And I knew that that was a special moment. I could smell it in the station. I could smell the fresh pain in the station. So, you know, I chased it all the way up to the Bronx where they terminate and then they come back. When I saw it coming back as I was waiting for it, I knew that I had achieved and reached a special moment in art history, I had breached the theoretical limitations that some of us sort of set on ourselves and even society, because, you know, you have to remember that most of society were pointing fingers at us. It was easy to create dialogue or a closed-minded conversation around this tangible thing of, uh, yeah, these trains are being overtaken and destroyed and vandalized by these young, misdirected, misfiring youth when it was the other way around. We were looking outside of ourselves, looking at city government failing us, a federal government saying drop dead to New York. You know, we're trying to invent something from nothing because there was nothing there left. It's an amazing feat that so many young individuals took on to the visual arts through this movement. I just felt that I was. the messenger trying to uh, make 
a louder statement in a very noisy town that was too busy for itself to acknowledge its young. This was the vehicles. These were the vehicles. These were literally the vehicles that were used. I mean, when you think about Instagram, I mean, this is 40 years before Instagram that this young generation was creating a conversation using these vehicles, moving in and out of light. It's a miracle on how that all came to be. This movement is very elastic in that way that it lives so much into the future. It's transcendent. It's transformative. It introduces the idea of transition. It's fine to change. It's fine to challenge yourself and not feel comfortable in a bubble or in a pocket or in a compartment. It's And that's what I thought at 15 years old. I am not just going to be another part of the alphabet soup going on here. I'm going to breach those velvet ropes of comfort and I'm going to bring it, like they say. I'm going to bring it because we need to turn the page, turn the page and create something not referencing art history, but making art history. You absolutely made art history. And I mean, that kind of leads us to my next question, which is, you know, 50 years of hip hop and, and you were at the epicenter of this cultural movement. How does it feel to be celebrating this 50-year milestone? First and foremost, uh, I think the word that comes to my head is perseverance. When you're persistent and consistent with your practice, believing that there is something there, not just for yourself, but for everyone around you, that's the power of hip-hop. That's the phenomenon of hip-hop. For myself, I was already painting before hip-hop was even a term seeing all this music come together and, you know, compelling people to like come to the open stage and then create all these other sort of like annex hurricanes around it. You know, one storm spawns another and pushes the other to the outer reaches of who knows where, right? I'm very proud to still be here. It's very exciting to see, but I'm here now for my 50th anniversary, which is next year, 2024. So 1974, I pick up my first cans of compressed color, as I like to call them. And I saved those colors off the dusty racks of hardware stores, never to see the light of day and creating light with them in the most darkest, most compressed places in, on earth, right? The subways. So next year is my 50th anniversary, and I'm proud to like be looking forward to it in so many ways with so many new projects. One of the projects that you're currently working on is a book. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's very uh, the, probably one of the most anticipated books coming from this sector of the woods. It wasn't strategic to wait this long. I just wanted to live life and grow through it alongside with my work on Canvas. So I think now coming to the dawning of the 50th anniversary, it's appropriate to have a book that's going to showcase my work as an artist not just as a phenomenon, um, but to put it all in context for people that this started from the, the bowels of the city and now has reached the museums of the world. It's very exciting. When you write a book or you do a documentary or whatever it is that you sort of, um, you know, you open up the aperture of your of your life. I always look at it as closing one chapter and enabling you to see the cl in clarity what's ahead for you. So again, that 10 car train was opening the clarity of the, of, you know, could have been very foggy. But after that feat, I was like, I'm on my way. I know my lane. I'm not getting off this highway. There's no exits for me. Same thing with uh, my work on Canvas. And uh, this book will be the, I won't let it out of the bag again, but there'll be, there'll be a lot to digest. Oh, we cannot wait for this book to come out. Lee Quinones, thank you so much again for your time today. Thank you for sharing these wonderful stories. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Get the complete story behind Lee Quinones' 1976 10 car caper via his book, available in spring 2024. The movie Wild Style celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. It's available for streaming via the Criterion channel and additional streaming services. This piece was written and produced by Janice Headley. Audio was mixed and mastered by Roddy Nickport. Before we go, just got it.
talk our ish a little bit. We found out last week that this podcast earned recognition around the world, winning an International Music Journalism Award at the Reeperbahn Festival in Hamburg, Germany. That's right. You're now officially listening to an award-winning podcast. Thanks to our amazing contributors, producers, and a variety of guests who've appeared on the show. Also, really just want to thank you for listening. We wouldn't be here without your trust in us to tell these stories. We still have about a dozen weeks ahead of us, which means a dozen more times to celebrate this hip-hop. So stay tuned. I'm Larry Mizell Jr. We'll see you next time on 50 Years of Hip-Hop from listener-powered KEXP, where the music matters.